Welcome to Meningitis Part 1. In this section, we'll discuss the pathophysiology and presentations of meningitis and encephalitis. Meningitis and encephalitis are infections of the central nervous system. Meningitis primarily affects the meninges. Encephalitis is confined to the brain parenchyma. If left untreated, meningitis and encephalitis cause a significant CNS dysfunction and sepsis, leading to lifelong neurological disabilities and even death. Therefore, there are both must-not-miss diagnoses in the emergency department. We'll talk about the pathophysiology of these two diseases. In terms of meningitis, it can be caused by bacteria, viral, and other causes. The main one we need to concern ourselves with would be meningitis caused by bacteria. Organisms enter the meninges through the bloodstream from other parts of the body. The main bacteria include strep pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitidis, and Haemophilus influenza. All these bacteria are part of the normal flora in the upper respiratory tract. Viral meningitis are usually caused by enterovirus and HSV, or the herpes simplex virus. And common causes for meningitis include TB, Lyme disease, and others. Encephalitis is usually caused by virus. They include the herpes simplex virus, varicella zoster virus, measles, and others. In terms of at-risk population, as with most infection, they include patients who are immunocompromised, such as those on chemotherapy, malnutrition, chronic steroid use, and those who have not been vaccinated. Another reason is if there is any break in the blood-brain barrier, the bacteria are more likely to invade. They include reasons such as surgery, trauma including basal skull fracture, or indwelling hardware such as VP shunts. Let's move on to presentation. In terms of history, patients with meningitis may complain of fever, headache, neck stiffness or pain, although less than 50% of patients have this classic triad for meningitis, particularly if it is early. The associated symptoms include decreased level of consciousness, either into confusion or lethargy. They can also include nausea, vomiting, and photophobia. Atypical symptoms can also occur particularly in the elderly or infants. These two groups might only have lethargy or decreased level of consciousness without headache or neck pain. For encephalitis, the symptoms are quite similar. The patients can complain of headache, fever, although neck pain is not as prominent since the meninges are not involved. They can also have decreased level of consciousness, confusion, or seizures. As with all infectious disease, it is also important to ask about travel, any sick contacts, and particularly if there is an outbreak in where they live. On physical examination, we pay special attention to the vital signs. They may have fever or signs of sepsis such as tachycardia or hypotension. In general, they may look well, particularly if they are early in their disease, or very unwell if they are late in the course. On the neurological examination, we look for focal neurological signs and papilledema. We will look for rashes, particularly for purpura. On examination, we also look for any signs of meningeal irritation. There are a few of them available. The first one is Kernick sign. This is when the patient's knee and hip are bent at 90 degrees. An extension of the knee is painful. Brzezinski sign, in which when the patient's neck is flexed, they lift their legs involuntarily. Nuchal rigidity, which the patients have difficulty flexing their neck. Jolt accentuation, in which moving the patient's neck quickly or jolting increase the patient's discomfort. All of these tests for meningeal irritation have low sensitivity and high specificity. That means that if your patient has it, that is much more likely that they have meningitis 
but if they do not have it, it does not mean they don't have the disease. For physical examination in patients with encephalitis, they will not have any signs of meningeal irritation. They may have a fever, a headache, have change in level of consciousness, or presents in a seizure. They may have cold sores to suggest herpes simplex virus. In summary, we talk about the pathophysiology and the history and physical in patients with meningitis and encephalitis. In the next video, we will discuss the treatment and investigations. Thank you for watching.